Good evening, everyone. I'm so glad to see everyone here bright and shiny. There's my note to tell me get here at 630. It has been a long month since the last time I saw all of you. So I'm so glad you're here. I see some new names. So I'm really thrilled uh, to see ah, Karen, you are here, even though it's the middle of the night where you are. Thank you. I see a lot of familiar faces, a lot of new faces. I'm so glad that my friend and colleague Ann Toms is going to be here with us today to talk about Prevenivet and also to talk about how to you know, put together a plan to pay for your pet's care if in fact you're not home and you're on vacation. And I'm so interested in listening to this because I'm leaving for vacation on August 11th and I want to make sure all of my pet's care needs are paid for in the event something happens. So before I ask Anne all of those questions and then open the floor for all of you to ask questions, I'm going to check in with our regulars and then check in with our new folk. So Connie, how's everything out in California? Well, everything here in, in Metro LA is a little cooler than it has been, and it's been extremely toasty in our deserts, uh, but we've got 11 wildfires going on in the, the Golden State, including one that just hit 90,000 acres up in the Mojave Desert that's going into Nevada. So again, disaster preparedness in California and, you know, other, other states as well. So, uh, you know, we're, we're all used to it, but it never gets easier. So Connie is our Wheaton aficionado. She shows uh, Wheaton's in confirmation and in performance. So she's been with us since the beginning of time because she was one of my first clients to make a map plan. So I love that she's here every time we start because she gives such great input and insight. And I think we sort of hear new things every week, right, Connie? Uh, pretty pretty much, um, because things are constantly evolving in the yes, dog world. They are. Yes, they are. Hey, Jan, how are you and how is Tonka? We are well, thanks. Um, everything is good. Not and you know, not getting out in the summer as much as we'd like because um, mom's been working a lot, but, but otherwise we're good. I hear the humidity has broken there as it has here in North Carolina. Yeah, I mean, the past few days have been spectacular, like, yeah. like perfect weather in the Northeast. Um, so yesterday, the high was like 78 degrees and dry. It was like, doesn't get much better than that. I know it just is incredible. I'm 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 reveling in being cold when I swim in the morning. It's you know we would get in the pool to swim and the pool would be as warm as the air and it was like you know this is, I could take a bath in this stuff. Uh, but I'm so glad that now it's still chilly and actually it's warmer to be in the water than out of the water here. So that's great, Kieran. I'm so glad you got to come here. The reason I commented earlier, everyone, is because Andy's oh there he is um, because he is uh, in Europe. Um, he's our resident European. He's Irish uh, and was in um, the Canary Islands. Was that? Yep. He was in the Canary Islands. But now I think you're back um, on the old sod. Is that true? On the old saturated sod. The wettest July in history we have had. Has it been <laughs> so, hot or cold? It's been quite good, actually. Just around 20, 22 degrees, which is... Um, Fairly warm by Irish standards, so you can yeah. you can actually walk outside without a coat, which is quite incredible. But um, you you need a hot umbrella. <laughs> <All right. laughs> oh God! And everything's good with you. Uh, Kieran is one of our resident authors too. He wrote a wonderful book called um, "When Your Child Wants a Pet: Let One Eyed Leo um, Lead the Conversation." I think I got it right. Pretty much? Ne nearly. I think half of the people in, on this call wrote it. So. <laughs> I, I only borrowed the super glue to try and jam it together. Because <laughs> it teaches um, both people who are adopting or thinking of buying a pet what they need to know before they get the pet. What a concept, right? All of us know it takes a lot more to own a pet than just to um, be, you know, walk into the rescue or walk into the breeders or walk into the pet shop and, and get one. Um, so he created this wonderful book with all of our input and it has been a roaring success. There are so many um, rescue groups, humane groups in Europe doing beautiful work with it. Am I right, Karen? That's it, yeah, yeah. Perfect. 
Perfect. So now I'm so thrilled to find out more about uh, Nora, Sandy, and Jeffrey. You don't have to speak if you don't want to, but what we usually do is we say who we are, where we're from, and what pet we have, because I know that Tonka lives with Jan, um, and Casey and Patsy live with Connie, um, and Kieran is petless. He is a good pet sitter for his friends. Uh, so every once in a while, we do have a pet that Karen introduces to us. So, um, Nora, do you want to go first? I know I know you, but <laughs> everyone else doesn't know you. Yeah, I mean, I'm just here to listen in. Um, I'm Nora Haskins <laughs> from New York. <laughs> Great. Wonderful. Welcome. Sandy, do you want to pipe in? I know you have a dachshund. <laughs> um, yes, I, uh, I'm from Indiana. I uh, just uh, recently looked up your Pure Dog Talk podcast and uh for some for one of our um for our parent club newsletter uh we were doing some research on some things and i said wait a minute i remember you know this episode we've got to get this information in there so um so i referred it to somebody who was writing it and uh and so anyway and then i kind of stumbled across the the map thing and and all that so i was like oh it's coming up so i uh just signed up and thought i would listen in as well Wonderful. Laura and I are good friends. She's been on the Why Do Pets Matter podcast as well, um, talking about purebred dogs because we talk about everything on Why Do Pets Matter. So I'm so glad that the um, podcast they did with Laura is still relevant. She's a good friend. We'll have to see if we can chat about something new and interesting about AKC soon um, to move on and and, and move ahead. Uh, Jeffrey, uh, how are you? Do you want to speak or it's okay? I I, I'm happy to speak. I'm I'm not showing my video because I didn't shave today. <laughs> so, That's okay. <laughs> I'm sparing you all. Um, so my name is Jeffrey Atwood. I'm a, a recent Deborah Hamilton super fan. <laughs> I saw her give a wonderful lecture for Sportsman Animal Medical Center in New York a couple of weeks ago. Um, I, I thought it was stupendous, and um, and so I was very, I'm very happy to join the group and learn from all of your expertise. I have three New Scoot German Shepherd dogs, a nine-year-old male, a six-year-old female, and a 16-month-old male who's still uh, a, a neutered, who's still intact. Um, so I have my hands full. I'm 102 pounds, and the other two are 82 pounds. Um, I live in Bloomfield, Connecticut, which is the home of Fidelco Guide Dogs, a big German Shepherd breeder. Uh, my mother was a friend of my late mother, was a friend of the late Mrs. Command, who started that whole business. Yep. Um, so I um, and I'm, you know, I'm I'm not a young guy. I'm in the Medicare cohort, so I uh, I am concerned about the care of my dog. Should I become all the D's? I, I don't think I'll become divorced at this point, but d dementia and death are certainly possibilities. So well, disability. So yeah, anyway. I'm so glad that you're here and I'm so glad that the talk at the AMC went well. I was really thrilled with it. I had hoped we'd have more questions at the end, but you know what? I Everybody can always come and talk to me. So uh, it really is thrilling. And I'm so glad you sent me. I also copied it off for tonight as well. Um, Jeffrey sent me the ASPCA information, you know, what to do to help uh, people know about your cat or your dog. Um, and it was it was really good information, which I had known about because I'm friends with a number of people at the ASPCA. However, it doesn't make it as easy as we make it here when we talk about it all the time because it spurs our brains. And that's why I brought my really dear friend who I had the most delicious breakfast with out in Denver, Colorado. She and I attended AVMA and Vet Partners together. She had to leave before AVMA was intact. She was only there for the Vet Partners. I was there for Vet Partners and AVMLA, which I, because I'm crazy, was the conference coordinator. So I got all the speakers, I got everybody organized, you know, herding cats. And that went over really well as, as well. So uh, Anne and I were sitting there talking and I said, I really think it's important what Preventivet does. And for any of you who don't know Anne, you've heard of her cohort, Kathy Mazdin, because she's the woman who I keep referring um, Susan uh, with Maggie to, uh, because Kathy is a great trainer. Um, and so, uh, and she's with Preventivet. So we have known each other for years. Um, both of uh, Anne and um, Kathy have been on my podcast, but I invited Anne here because she came up with such an important thought, 
while we were having breakfast that I said, mm, everybody should really think about this. Now we know about the D's, right? There is dementia, divorce, delay, disease, disaster, um, disability, delay, uh, uh, deployment, domestic violence, you know, to name just, I think eight or nine of them, I can go to 10 if you want. Uh, but what we didn't think about um, was debt. You know, how do we, how do we handle the debt that may be incurred by our caregivers while we're gone? Um, do you leave your credit card with your um, veterinarian? Do you leave your credit card with your caregiver? Some might say, hmm, I'm not so sure I want to do that. Uh, so Anne and I had a conversation. She said she had some great information from Preventivet that she's going to share with us tonight, either in the chat or it'll come in the link with the show notes and the, and the recording. First, Anne, welcome to uh, the MAP plan and tell us who your pets are and where you're from. Well, thank you, uh, Deborah. It's really nice to see you and be part of this group. I'm originally from Canada. I have been in Seattle for 12 years now. And um, I started, I came to the U.S. to be part of a pet insurance company at the strategic level uh, just for a short period of time. And um, I got there by producing, I had my own corporate marketing agency, producing a story with my two dogs at the time, um, a video story about how pet insurance had helped our family uh, avoid a, a lot of extra cost. And we had two Portuguese water dogs at that time. We had a very, very healthy one and a, a very sick one. Um, sick in the sense that he had many conditions, they were manageable. So he, he was diagnosed with lupus at the age of seven. And then he got um, diabetes and then cataracts and started to go blind as a result of that. And he had just a few complications with those conditions. He lived a great life until 15 and a half. But by the time um, he had passed, we had been reimbursed well over $40,000 um, for his care. And it's just incredible how medication for a chronic disease can add up over time. So I had produced a video story um, just talking about how, how the product had helped our lives. And I sent it to um, the pet insurance company and the CEO within an hour called me at my desk and said, uh, okay, I've put the tissues down now and like, tell me about yourself. Like, why do you know so much about our business? And, and I said, well, A, that's what I do for a living, but B, um, I have dogs and I know, you know, the impact that they have on our lives and um, how much peace of mind I had knowing that I could do whatever it took to, to care for them. We lost our healthy dog first, um, which is the, the tearjerker of the story. Um, we lost her within eight hours um, with a tumor that we didn't know was um, festering inside. So um, things can happen at any point in time. You never know. And um, I joined that, that insurance company um, just for a short period of time. I was meant to go back and continue with my company and my employees back in Canada, but ended up loving it here in the Pacific Northwest. The temperature here is lovely and um, decided to start Preventive Vets because what I learned being in the industry was that there was so much, it was about 70% of things that were going through the emergency room um, could have been avoided if somebody had only known something very simple. And you don't know what you don't know. Like it's hard to prevent things that you don't really realize um, are preventable or that exist. So we created a resource. We have veterinarians and certified behavior consultants on our team who create the plethora of content on our website. That is a free resource um, for everyone called preventivevet.com. And it's a resource that um, millions and millions of people come to every year to, to seek out advice. We give free, free advice. So on any article, any topic that you have interest in learning more about, just ask and our team of medical and behavioral professionals will, will answer. And the One link is in the chat right now in case anybody um, wants to know that they can pull up um, the link. In, we did this a long time ago. We created a treatment authorization form. So what I was learning from veterinarians was that, um, you know, stuff happens like it did for our dog um, within, you know, a, a few hours she had collapsed. 
from not feeling well and collapsed and we had to take her to the ER. And had we not been there, had it been a, with a sitter or a family member whom we were always um, having take care of our pets while we were away, um, I wouldn't have had a plan in place. I wouldn't have, I didn't leave, I left them with the numbers of our vet, you know, and the address and all of that, but I never left them with the, the money part of it. And even though we had pet insurance, I mean, it's still, it's an, you have to pass that authority on to somebody else to, to have, to give the medical um, guidance and, and authority to take care of your pet. And then there's the cost of it. And who's, who's responsible for that? Well, you as the, the pet owner is. So we put together a treatment authorization form um, and over breakfast, Deborah and I were talking about it and she made a couple of really good points on questions that I had about payment and how to include it in the form. So we just added a section of that um, in the last couple of weeks. So there's a really great section in there to um, help you guide your caregiver while you're away on how to pay for the services and give authority to them and the veterinary professional to give your pet care in your absence. I mean, there are many times we're in different time zones, might be in the middle of a, of a dead zone for cell service and you aren't reachable. And it's happened to many people. Um, one of the veterinarians on our team, her pet sitter had to um, put her cat down while she was away and she was driving as fast as she could to get back, but she couldn't. And so it happens a lot and to be prepared is best. It really is. It's part of that um, preparedness, you know, having the veterinarian know what you want to do, having your caregivers, so you've appointed your caregivers, you know who your vet is, you've given your vet the information about your caregivers. However, that one extra piece, which is, okay, so who pays for the care when something occurs, either an accident that happens or a sickness that comes up, and and how do you do that? Do you leave a credit card with the um, with the veterinarian or do you just drop off this form with all the information filled out? And I believe we did add a place where the credit card can be added, correct, Anne? Didn't. However, <laughs> um, we did add to, with your advice on where they could contact, who they could contact to get that information. Not, not everybody wants to put their credit card information on a piece of paper that's gonna be floating around, um, especially if you're handing it to a pet sitter. If you're handing it to your veterinarian, then it's going on file and, and you know that's fine. But um, you know, people, unless they have somebody going through the paper files or in the computer, you know, nothing is foolproof, right? So we not, talked about that at breakfast, nothing is yeah. foolproof. However, if you have to pay, um, unless you have Trupanion, which tells you how much you're covered for, and then you only have to pay a portion of it, uh, it's it's a big nut to crack if something is really wrong, a spleen is burst or a leg yeah. is broken or something has occurred uh, and you're away. So, so being able to, when you give your veterinarian, as you know, you have to, the people who are allowed to bring your pet in to care for it, then that's the information um, that would also carry and when they come in, um, these are the two people who will have credit cards. Maybe, you know, your mother, your sister, your aunt, your uncle will be the people who will have your credit card because you trust them. Um, or you leave them with your vet and it'll be in the computer. Um, I don't know how everybody feels about that. But for me, being able to, I mean, first of all, our caregivers, we usually know really well. Um, and we trust most of them really, really greatly. However, if if it's a dog walker or something that you don't know very well, or if it's a new caregiver who's done great for the last two times you've been away, but you still don't know her really well, maybe that wouldn't be someone you'd leave your credit card with. However, you know, Sally is not here tonight because she's going on vacation. How dare she with my girls? Uh, <laughs> And uh, she has left a girl in charge and she today, thinking ahead, connected all of us through text. So she knows who we are, which numbers, and she can hit a joint text to let us know if something happens. And of course, my credit card is at the ready. There will be no question. I will call whatever vet she takes um, Athena or Roxy to because Athena 
will be uh, 14 in October uh, and Roxy was just 13. So, you know, these are older dogs. You really do have to be able to react in a minute uh, if something is different. So when you're going away, make sure that um, you connect the people who are going to care for your pets. You know, we always want redundancy. Have this form and maybe bring it to your vet. I think, Anne, you and I talked about that. Most vets don't have anything available for you to give them when you're on vacation and the caregiver is going to bring your dog in. No, we definitely recommend bringing the form in. So it's a two, it's a two page form. It can be filled out online and then printed or sent electronically. And it's um, got a great article by um, Dr. Turner, Dr. Beth Turner yeah. as well, labeled "Who Makes Medical Decisions for Your Pet When You Can't?" Um, you know, death, disease, dementia. Right. You, you need to make sure you know who's going to make those decisions, um, uh. so that when you recover. Uh, the dogs are there or the dogs aren't because they were suffering and they didn't wait for you to make that decision. Like you said, the veterinarian's caregiver had to put the cat down because she was probably suffering and the vet wanted to be there, but yeah. wouldn't want the vet, the cat to continue to suffer waiting for her to get there. I mean, I think well, that's she was, selfless. Yeah. She was fortunate enough to be at least on the phone communicating her wishes, but yeah. I know like our cousins um, on my husband's side, had to put their family dog down while their parents were on a cruise. They couldn't get a hold of them. This was a dearly loved animal. And they were, you know, upset that they couldn't say goodbye. And I think they would have authorized the cost of perhaps just keeping keeping the dog comfortable. I don't know the medical situation, right. but if it was palliative care and the animal would have been comfortable, yeah, they would have. However, yeah. you can't get in touch. Um, and that can be written on this form, right? It can exactly. say if the animal can be kept comfortable um, until I arrive. Great. You know, it, it tells the vet, it gives that vet that additional information. Um, so, Anne, please tell us anything more you're thinking about this, because I just think that this form is brilliant. I know I have the form in the map plan for us to make. Um, to give our caregivers and to let the vet know who the caregiver is. So I've always uh, relied on the caregiver to transmit that information to the veterinarian. But when I was sitting at breakfast with Ann, I said, well, how stupid is that? She's so brilliant having a form where I, the owner, have it stuck in the file and saying, well, this is what I'd like to happen if an emergency occurs with my pet while I'm away. Um, it just was brilliant, I thought. And that's why I wanted Ann to come here and chat with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So does we anybody all, have any questions? <laughs> so it's, it, we all travel and we all have pets. So there's, there's a time for this um, for all of us. So jump in there if anybody has any questions, because I have a ton of them, um, but I'm always running the show. So uh, I know, Connie, you probably have some and, and Jan, you do. I, uh, this Jeff is Jeffrey. I, would, <clears throat> I just have a quick comment. Uh, a daycare that I use, uh, Jan might know who they are, Kessler Kennel Farms in East Granby. So when you leave your dog there, they make you sign a medical form, which indicates uh, what you want to happen if your dog becomes, you know, they'll take it to an emergency vet. But they put a dollar limit on the amount that they can spend without your consent, which I thought was a, a pretty good option. Um, and uh, so... And also you give your credit card number so that they basically have the information in case your dog has a medical emergency and they, it needs to be treated and they can't reach you. Uh, that's mm -hmm. all it's going to say. Do they set the limit or do they allow you to set the limit? They allow you to set the limit. Um, so I'll, you know, I'll, tell, I'll be honest with you. I set a very big limit for, you know, I thought if my three dogs are there and heaven forbid, all three, you know, I, and, you know, but these days it's really hard not to reach somebody. Technically, I could travel someplace, and, and the, you know, I'm occasionally out of range even today. So, um, so you know, but anyway, that's yeah. They it, they allow you to set the limit. Yeah. Um, one option that I, that I use and have used for years and years, uh, if you if your vet is in the position to do so, is if your vet has boarding facilities. I always leave my dogs when I go out of town at the vet. Uh, just in case, God forbid, one of them gets sick, they're right there, and the the vet and uh, the vets and the vet techs know them. You know their their entire medical records are on file. They know me, and when I check them in to board, uh, you know I sign a release authorizing uh, any necessary 
uh, medical intervention or medical care in case I cannot be reached. And I always leave my cell phone number. Uh, and I always leave an emergency contact so that they have the name of, for instance, you know, my niece or my friend or, you know, whoever uh, is is in the area and knows I'm going to be gone and, you know, can, can come uh, to to actually uh, take care of the animals, but the but that way I know the animals are cared for uh, the whole time I'm gone, and uh, and and they have my credit card number and they can certainly reach me on cell phone if if they need to. So uh, and I always tell them you know the vicinity that I'm going uh, mm -hmm. into so that you know they know time zone differences and so on and so forth since we're here on the west coast. So uh, if your vet has boarding facilities, that's really the safest place to leave your dogs or cats. It absolutely is. The, the drawback I sometimes had here in North Carolina, and you might not have that, is um, my veterinarians left at seven at night and didn't come back till six in the morning. And that was a little too long for me to have my dogs not be observed and they didn't have any cameras um and so with bloat and irish setters yeah. i'm like yeah 12 hours i'm not going to take that we, well eight hours i'm not going to take that chance and it's fine because they will be there in the event they walk in and something's wrong they're going to be immediately taken care of as uh, as opposed to others um if you do check out uh, say kennels or or here we have a beach spa for dogs uh, make sure that you ask that question whether or not they have 24-hour observation um, of the dogs because it is key that if a dog is going to get sick they're never getting sick between eight and four um, very infrequently do they get sick between eight and four when veterinary offices are open uh, that's why we all pay the big bucks at the emergency veterinarian uh, and really, you you want to make sure that if if they're going to be there, that that there's someone who's who's an overnight person. Um, right. And really good vets do have overnight people yes, when they, they run when they run a kennel situation or if they do surgeries. Because leaving a dog, I just um, have a case where a dog was left right after she gave birth to puppies. The vet went out and got dinner. Um, and, and she passed away and there was nothing wrong with her when he, oh. she left, but there was nobody there watching the store for an hour and a half while he was out having dinner. And he really didn't feel as if there was anything going to go wrong. She seemed fine. And we all know who are breeders. Um, things can go wrong and they can go wrong really fast after a birth. So uh, making sure that, you know, if you have older dogs, um, if you have dogs that are subject to a certain something, something like I have bloat in my um, my lineage, I almost never leave them alone in the house. I just get worried. And uh, and so when Jim and I are traveling, I not only have um, backup and a spare, I have either my friends coming to stay with them, my dog walker or dog sitter coming to stay with them, or I'm going to bring them to the kennel in Raleigh. <laughs> where they go swimming every day because it's really a tough life to be my dog um, and get ice cream every night because I feel <laughs> guilty, right? Uh, they'll go to one of those three places, but all of them will be sleeping overnight. So I caution everyone to just make sure what the watching is because if, if things are going to go wrong, they're going to go wrong while your caregiver isn't there. Um, so make sure your caregiver's times of not being there um, are infrequent. And the easy thing to do, I'm sharing it with my people, is get a Nest camera and give them access to it while they're watching the dog so that they can watch them bounce around on the couch and on the chair and wrestle with each other. Uh, so you know exactly how the lamp broke when you get back. I mean, just a suggestion, not that it's ever happened in my house. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else have any questions? Jan, what are you thinking? No, I'm I'm never comfortable. I, I haven't had very good experiences with not having 24-hour um, supervision. Um, one of the kennels that I used to go where I lived actually had a fire, and um, they only had people there from like till 8 p.m., and then they came like the next morning at 6, and that was just like, I mean, at that time, Tonka wasn't there, but I think that just made me feel so uncomfortable. The fact that they didn't have someone on duty all the time, even if they have cameras in a situation like that, you know, something can happen very quickly yep. and, you know, doesn't matter how close you live. 
<laughs> and so for me, um, my information is on file with my vet. So if, and then I've, I have arrangements with everybody else. If I bring it to the girl who's not close to me anymore, but then my co-author Mia lives right near that vet lives right, right near her. So she would take him to him. Ian, go I right. Will say, yeah. I will just say that even if payment is taken care of, the veterinarian cannot do anything to that animal without authorization. Yep. So you have to be giving that authorization or handing that power of attorney to someone else. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. And it needs to be documented. So with your signature. So that's the missing piece that a lot of people don't realize when they leave town um, is, is that, yes, your caregiver may have all the means to pay for it themselves and do whatever and, and be there all the time and all of that. But it's the veterinarian who cannot move forward without that authorization. Mm -hmm. Right. It's called the um, veterinary VCPR, veterinary client patient mm -hmm. relationship. And if they don't have it with, with your caregiver, because it isn't documented in the file, they really are not supposed to care for your pet. Now, Ann and I will cross our fingers and close our eyes. They probably will because they know your dog if they bring it to your vet. However, they're not supposed to. It is it is totally not what they're supposed to do. Well, so one, they're putting they're, themselves in jeopardy. Yeah. In absolute jeopardy. Um, absolutely. However, it is really important for you to make their lives easier to not have them make that decision of taking care of a beloved pet for a wonderful client, uh, but rather making sure uh, that you keep everybody together um, and healthy because it is, it is so important that everyone know who is the person in charge. Um, and you know your vet's going to call you anyway, even if your caregiver comes in, um, they're going to try to get in touch with you. I mean, to this day, my vet calls me when Sally and Gordon bring Athena and Roxy uh, to her because, you know, for 13 years, I was the one. And now they're with better parents, I must say. Uh, but, you know, she calls me even though they have total um, ability to care for the dogs and uh, they've been given every permission known to man. Um, she still calls me. So if you have a really great vet, they may put their license in jeopardy, uh, but it you shouldn't make them do that, right? And that is not a position well, you need to put your veterinarian in. Yeah. And I, I run an organization that serves global constituents and especially all those around the U.S., and not everybody has that kind of relationship with their veterinarian. And if you are even moving, if you are even getting a pet sitter, which, you know, the rovers and the pet sitters are out there. Dog they might not, yep. Yeah, they're not in your community. So they're not necessarily going to go to your vet. And if it is an emergency, it's going to be with an emergency vet. Oh, baby. Look at that baby. Is that the baby, Jeff, or is that one of the older ones? That, that's the nine-year-old. Oh, she's beautiful. It's a he, yeah. So oh, and he's here's right. the here's the baby. He's he's got, got a cone. cone on. Oh, he's now, got a cone of shame on. He had a uh, pyoderma on his foot. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt everybody's conversation, but no, no, that's really fine. Go right crazy. ahead. So, so and continue because it is really important that we respect the responsibilities of our veterinarian, um, even if you have a great relationship, because they really truly wanna make sure that they're doing everything correctly. Absolutely. And, and as you said, um, these things never happen at the right time of day. And often you're going to a, an emergency veterinarian and you might not have that kind of relationship. Unlikely. And if that happens, the form that you're filling out here um, for your veterinarian to have should also be in the folder for your caregiver, because if it's going, they're going to have to bring that with them to the other vet. So it's great that we drop them off with our vet, but you have to have an area. You know, redundancy is my favorite word in this map plan ever, because I always want redundant caregivers, just in case one falls down and breaks their ankle, you have another one to back them up. Not that when you leave, you only have one person. Uh, I said before, I have, you know, the people who come and sit with them, my friends who want to come sit with them, and then I'll drop them off at Cobble Hill. And I will pay for time 
at a, a kennel that I really trust and love. It's a, it's a dog show kennel. So I know that they know um, that they need to be aware of the dogs 24 um, seven. It, it really is important. Uh, so I just want to uh, wrap up by asking everyone um, and thanking Anne so much for coming here and giving us this wonderful document. If anybody's going on vacation, I know I've printed it out and I've given it to everyone uh, for the 11th. And I know that my friend Kathy, who's been here for some of the map calls, also printed it out. Um, so I would love to get last thoughts from Nora or Jeffrey or Sandy or Connie um, as signing off, because it really is an important thing that... We might, not, we might not think about that having this form, I mean, you have all the forms in the map plan, uh, but this is an additional form above and beyond that I'm so grateful um, Anne shared it with the group. Yeah, I, I actually have a question about this. It was one, it, can you give permission verbally? Can the owner give permission verbally? And that may be on a state or local basis. My other question is, and I'm gonna check with my, I'm sorry, my dogs have- That's all right. Sense. We always have barking dogs. Yeah, thank you. Um, is that um, you know? I'm going to check with the emergency vets that that might be used in my area. Will they accept this form, um, or do they require their own form? So that's a I don't that's know. If a that's a great question. The first question, and Anne, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, verbal is never going to work. Uh, text is better than nothing. Text isn't great. I hate texts, but everybody does it. Um, listen, Dr. Smith, I'm going out of town and this is my caregiver and um, call me if you need a credit card and everything's hunky dory and this is her number. Um, and I give her permission to bring the dog in. Is it great? No, but it's better than just calling and leaving a message on his phone. So he has something in writing that says, yes, Deborah said Ann Toms, it could bring the dog in. And so when Ann brought the dog in, I took care of it because this is um, each vet may have uh, a form that you fill out that's similar to what Ann has. Uh, however, you know, I'm the kind of person who fills out, where is it, my priority mail stickers before I get to the post office so that I don't have to fill it out there. And so I would fill this out see if it says more than they ever thought, because it usually does. It's like the map plan. Nobody ever thinks when you go to the your attorney, the attorney says, well, I never thought of that. I never thought of that. And I never thought of that either. Um, so they usually don't think of the things that Anne's form is thought about because of the, the background she has and the people in her uh, preventive team that have thrown this together. And then you know, um, bagels and coffee with me in, in Colorado. So, you know, there you go. There's so many people who've put their mind together, not in a pressure situation, um, to think about what you need to know when you're going out of town and what the vet needs to know when you're going out of town. So I wouldn't be um, adverse to bringing this and maybe they'll say, well, this is really nice, um, but we have our own, would you fill it out? And don't get you know, snippy, say, okay, fine. And can I also leave this one just so that you have an air and a spare uh, because this probably has more information um, and make sure that you fill everything out that they need, but always check with them before you go. Just, uh, you know, just to put a point on that, it's have, have your caregiver have the form with them. It's better than nothing. Um, a veterinarian wants to give care to the animal. If, if there is some way of, of them proving that that's your signature on the form and that's you and that's your pet and you have the authority to give the authority to somebody else, they'll do it. Um, it it's better than nothing. And certainly if you have relationships or you are near where that pet will be brought in in your absence, by all means, go in and just let them know. Um, vets want to be able to help. So, you know, this just helps them do that. And yeah. I, I mean, you have to give permission to that caregiver to make some decisions in, in your absence. Yep, you absolutely have to. And, and making sure they know is really key. And this gives you that opportunity to have a conversation with them as well. Uh, because you're not there, unfortunately. Um, Nora or Sandy, any comments you'd like to add? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll just add. I think I'll tack on to what Jeffrey. I think it was Jeffrey said that uh, his dog care um, gives a certain amount that they can spend on emergency care um, instead of giving our traditional Visa, MasterCards, or what have you over to somebody. Wouldn't something like care credit work as well, since you don't have to use it, but you can open a care credit account 
it's directly with the veterinarian, they can use it. I'm just curious if that would just be an option as a comfort level. Um, I know in DVM News also about a month ago, um, Pet Card signed a deal with a financial institution to launch a um, pet credit card as well that um, participating veterinarians and veterinary hospitals are using. That might be an option just to have it opened. And then along the lines of what Jeffrey was saying, give, okay, you have the option to charge $10,000, but it keeps it kind of away from your personal credit mm -hmm. cards for other things as well. Just my yeah. two cents. Yeah. Yep. Go ahead, Ann. Well, care credit is like a credit card. So having, having that and having it on file with them is definitely beneficial. Um, again, you, you need some kind of form that tells them what they can what the limit is they can put on that. So like our treatment authorization form has a place to fill that out. So whether it's thousand dollars or $10,000 that gives them the authority to, to do the necessary care and apply it to the card they have on file. Um, if they don't have that number, if they don't know what that is, they can't go ahead and make decisions on your behalf because there are so many decisions. Um, there's plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. Um, and they have to know which one to go for. And obviously they want to go for plan A, but that's going to be um, the most costly and it gets them into a whole world of hurt. And that's where they get sued um, when they go ahead and do things that were not authorized. So it comes down to having the, the payment on file, having the limit that they can, that they're authorized for, and then having the decision maker say, yes, do that plan. Um, and even if it's a temporary decision maker for your vacation, because it's your caregiver there, I, I have to agree with that. I don't know that they can, um, trigger your coverage with care credit, um, without this document that says you can use up to $10,000 of my care credit. And I would have to ask the people from care credit, if that would be enough for them to allow uh, the credit card to be used. Um, I don't think I've ever heard of that question. It's a great question, Nora. I don't think I've ever heard of the question that you could leave your caregiver with the ability to use your care credit card for your pet. Um, it's not you, it's your caregiver and it's your pet. Uh, and you have a, say a $10,000 um, limit on care credit. Um, it's just um, important to uh, uh, make sure you you know this before. So, um, Nora, I'm going to find out that the answer to that question. I think Anne wants to know too. Yeah, yeah. Because that's a great question. I don't know if you. I mean, because I give my credit cards to my sons all the time, much to my chagrin. Um, and they use them with a plume and have no issue uh, with charging to me. Uh, so it might be okay that you can give it to a caregiver if the caregiver is on the slip um, with the vet. So I'm going to call Care Credit and find that answer out, and I'll tell everyone next week. Um, Sandy, do you have any questions? Ah, uh, no. I just have been learning a lot, and uh, I, you know, there's more I want to go back and you know, kind of look at and you know, put in place. And um, it's a lot of great food for thought. So. Oh, well, we're so glad you're here and, you know, know that national clubs call me all the time to come and talk to their owners um, about this because most, I love you very much. I love all breeders very much. And they never have a plan in place uh, for their pets. They never have a plan in place and they travel with their pets right, Connie? And they never have a plan in place um, for if they are disabled, they might have something in their will um, that will disperse the dogs and all the stuff uh, if they get killed. Uh, however, if they're still alive, uh, they need to have a plan in place for the care of their dogs, or they might be dispersed. And when they get better, they won't have any dogs left. I've had three clients that that's happened to. So it, it really... <laughs> Writing this stuff down, it it because I've had these cases and I've had these unfortunate experiences is why I created this program because we don't know what we don't know until we live it. And I lived it in 2013 with a broken ankle and nine dogs. Um, so trust me, been there, done that, realized I had nothing in place and my dogs were sort of um, at the mercy of my husband who was wonderful and my you know dog sitter who was wonderful but I had not made a plan. So that's why this started. 
So national clubs, um, Aubrey clubs, I think I'm going to speak in Detroit. And then in, I think I'm coming out to California, Connie. So I'll let you know, um, because it really is important to, especially if there's a cluster coming up, it's really important to sit down and have a moment where people are going to, like Ann said, take the time to give information to the people who need to know it. So your animals can be cared for. And we with you know, beautiful show dogs um, and anyone with a dog period uh, wants to make sure they get the best care for their pet. And that's not necessarily going to happen unless you write it down, tell people what you want them to do um, and then give it. So it's remember, it's the map plan, make a plan, appoint caregivers, write down the, uh, address the needs of your pet and then publish that plan <laughs> with the people who need to know. Otherwise it is not any use and it drives me nuts when people don't do that. Um, it is now, my goodness, 716, but it's been a month since we all talked. So I'm so glad everybody stayed on for the extra time. And thank you so much. You've spurred such great conversation and thank you for sharing the document with us. Everybody should go to Prevetivet just to see what's available there. And as she said, as Ann said, it's free. It's not like, you know, you have to charge your subscription, but it really is an incredible website. Thank you for having me. It was fun. I love you. And uh, make sure you come back so you make a plan for your pets. <laughs> I'm relentless, right, Connie? I am relentless. <laughs> So everybody have a great night. Um, kiss all your dogs for me, especially that little Casey and Patsy. And of course, um, the Dachshunds. I love standard Dachshunds. Are they standard, Sandy, or are they minis? Uh, they're standards. Standard oh, I love standards. Yeah. I had standards. I love them to pieces. Um, <laughs> they, they just were perfect. Uh, but I'm down to only one dog now. Maybe I'll get back into it when I'm a little older. <laughs> old enough. <laughs> anyway, everyone have a great week and we will see you September 6th. Correct, Rose? It's September 6th. That's the first Wednesday. And then do me a favor and let me know if you want to go back to every Wednesday, which I'm fine doing, or if once a month is going to be enough. So just let me know. And until then, kiss all your babies for me. And this is Deborah Hamilton, and you've been listening to The Map Plan. <laughs>